Hello everyone, and uh, we're back after Pesach. Baruch Hashem, hope you had a great holidays. And uh, we'll make an interesting shiur today, different than the usual. Just a few things before I start the shiur, a few announcements. Uh, the lectures here, I'm very sorry that we didn't change it in the website, it's 8.30. I told Shlomo, 8.30, not 8, because summer schedule, it's not even, it's, it's going to be light until 8.30. So 8.30 for the rest of the summer. Remember that I have a lot of trips. So before, please, the day of the lecture, not a few days before, sometimes we change it in the last minute. The day of the lecture, Sunday morning, afternoon, check that the lecture is on. If you see the lecture is on, then, we, then I'm here. If not, that means I'm not in New York. And also, I made, Baruch Hashem, with uh, Hashem's help, three new CD collections. Until now, we had number one, two, three, and four. We had Pirkei Avot and Mesilat Yisharim, Pat to the Just. So I had six MP3 in English. We added three more. Now we have number five, number six, number seven, 19 lectures on each. 30 hours of lecture, so those three CDs alone is 90 hours of, of lectures, 90 extra hours for you to have in a car. For all the people who are addicted to these lectures, now we have another few months to go until we make the new collections, Bezrat Hashem. Also in Hebrew, we made two new collections. We had only one and two, Pirkei Avot and Mesilat Yishari. Now we have number three and four. Also 30 hours on each, Baruch Hashem, with Hashem's help. Uh, everyone can order it from the website for cost price of only one dollar. The more you order, the better you give it to people. They come closer to Hashem, it's going to be 100% your profit. As I always say, the Gemara say, if you make other people make mitzvot, your reward is bigger than theirs. Remember this, there's no better opportunity than this. Just always remember that. Whatever you're going to do between you and Hashem, it's beautiful. But Hashem gave you a bonus card that you can make it a thousand times greater, basically doing nothing. Just a few dollars, you give it to your friends, they start listening, every minute they listen goes to your account. Every mitzvah they're going to keep goes to your account. Every mitzvah their children are going to do, they learn in Talmud Torah, Yeshiva, all day goes to your account. One day they have grandchildren, goes to your account. You already can be in heaven. Every year, Rosh Hashanah, Hashem takes your file. Another trillion mitzvot this year. You say, what? I'm already dead. How another trillion mitzvot? Hashem show you. 500 kids, 200, depend how many CDs you gave out. It's the best thing. Books anyway, nobody reads today. And it costs you $25 each, <laughs> you know. So uh, if you want to start giving out books, you need to be a millionaire. And anyway, 90% of the people would leave it on the shelf to accumulate some dust. <laughs> CDs, at least more than half of them are curious to know what's in it. So they listen, they get hooked up. Once they're in, that's it, they get addicted. And sometimes you get lucky, they hear every CD three, four times. So it's 100 hours of learning Torah for the one dollar you donated goes to your account. Now you tell me, please tell me, I'm not uh, embarrassed to say it, if you find in the entire world a better investment than this, please let me know. I want to know. I didn't find anything that come even to 1% near this. Now also remember one thing. There are many CDs out there, many, many CDs. They talk about Parashat Shavua, all kinds of beautiful things, which is very nice. It's all Torah. But there are not that many CDs who wake up the people to make tshuva. The people can learn 20 years Torah and CDs and still stay Mechalel Shabbat, not over here. Over here, if they listen to this CD once or twice, they suffer being Mechalel Shabbat. They suffer eating not kosher. They suffer. He suffer with all the things that he does. So there are two possibilities. One, he become Baal Tshuva, and second, he cannot hear anymore. Why? Because he suffers. He doesn't want to suffer, so he want to run away from the truth. Fine. But many of them become Baalei Tshuva. That's the concept of this entire thing, CDs. Also, we have a new app on the website, courtesy of great Jews who likes to help. 
So we made a much better app now. The old one was primitive with lots of problems. It's a whole new Android and Apple. And in, uh, within days, it's going to be on the App Store. So you can tell everyone, divineinformation.com, all free. You know, you can get all the lectures. There's more than a 1,000 lectures for free or on your phone. You don't even need CDs for yourself. For other people, CD is like a business card. When you hand them something in their hand, it's much more than giving them a business card and say, go to this website. They won't go. If you hand it to them, they feel more commitment to listen, especially if you say a few words of recommendation. You, you want to listen to it. Even one of the lectures, you point, you said, listen to this lecture. Out of curiosity, you listen to all the others. Just like in music. Tell him this song is great. He will be curious to know what's the other songs on the, on the CD. You never know. Because I'm telling you, Today I got an email, a guy from Israel, and he said to me, one sentence that you say in one of your lectures changed my whole life. One sentence. You never know what sentence work on what, what neshama. I said to him, I said in that lecture about the importance of taking a time out and go to yeshiva to know the foundation of Judaism. He decided that he has to do it. He did it. Now he's learning full time in yeshiva. One sentence changed his whole life. He took off, he wanted to test, he tried. Another guy, as we speak, came today to Yeshiva, two or three lectures. He was living with Goya in the same house, broke up with her, now he's in Yeshiva. So you never know, one word in the lecture can change someone's life. You know, I know one person that is one of the biggest rabbis in the world today, if not the biggest, up to 50 years old, and he became Baal Tshuva about 30 years ago from one sentence he heard on a CD, on a tape. It wasn't CDs in those days. It was an audio cassette. What was, the, what was the sentence in Hebrew? Yesh Adam chai et kol chayav betaut. How many words? Yesh Adam chai et kol chayav betaut. Seven words. Changed his whole life. Translation. There are people who lived all their life in mistake. And he started to think, maybe I'm one of them. He started to get interested. To check. You can't stand near him today. If you know what the Talmud Chacham. Thousands of books, com complete shlita. Learning non-stop, 20 hours a day. Strong emuna, kedusha, tzniut. 100%, like the, like the way the Torah expect a person to be, that's this person. Not only Torah, Torah, Yirat Shamay, Midot, Kedusha, Tzniut, Chesed, everything. One sentence, one sentence. Now we're going to speak about a few issues. You know, we are now in the days of Sfirat HaOmer. There's an argument between the Rambam and other Chachamim if the Sfirat HaOmer is from the Torah or from the Rabbanan. Once the Bet HaMikdash existed, then for sure it was from the Torah. After that, there's the question if it's a memory of the Korban HaOmer, of what we used to do, or it's just the Chachamim wanted this mitzvah to stay for the time the third Bet HaMikdash will be built, that everything will be routine. After 2,000 years, people may forget it. So the Rambam thinks that it's still mitzvah from the Torah. Well, almost everybody else disagree. And Mekubal, Rabbi Yosef Karo and Shulchan Aruch, that's where we go, we go by the Shulchan Aruch, that it's a rabbinical law. But, of course, we don't say that rabbinical law is anything less than a Torah law, because the Torah said to listen to the Chachamim. We have a restriction of listening to music, to play instrument, to listen to happy music, even sad music. And... Uh, to say Shechianu, so if Shabbat, it's allowed. If a person has something new for Shabbat, Shabbat is a different story. But other than that, you know, that's it. It's the days of the Omer, until Lagba like Omer, no shaving, no haircut. Haircut is much more serious than shaving. There's no permission whatsoever to anyone. But uh, the beard, some Chachamim say that if it bothers a person very, very much, Lichvot Shabbat, is allowed to fix. Some say no, but some say yes. If a person really, really suffers from it, 
He has who to count on, especially in his business. Maybe they give him restriction, they will fire you, you know, the way you look, whatever. So they are, he has to ask a chacham what to do. What to do. But that's overall the days that we are in. According to the Zohar, these days is like a long cholam wed of Shavuot, from Pesach to Shavuot. It's the counting and the preparation from the acceptance of the Torah. According to the Zohar, if a person forgets to count the Omer, we're talking about men, women are not obligated to keep, to count. Every mitzvah that a woman is not obligated to, to do, if she does, she gets a reward, like, like eno metzuve veose, which means she's not obligated, but Hashem gives a reward for doing. The custom of the Sfaradim, when a woman is not obligated and she still wants to do the mitzvah, she cannot make a bracha, because it's like saying a lie. God ordered me to do it, and God did not order her to do it. He only ordered the men. Therefore, she, doesn't have, she cannot say the bracha. The Ashkenazim have a different custom. They make the bracha even if they're not obligated. Why? Because they say it's a general praising of Hashem. It's not only for the actual order of me or not. It's an order for Klal Israel, and I'm a Shabchim et Hashem, it's like Shvach. So the Ashkenazim, if they make a, a lulav on Sukkot, the women, they make bracha. Not all, but some. Sfaradim not allowed to make bracha. Also, the, in the morning when they pray, Chacham Ovadia in his Sidur, he said that the women won't say the name of Hashem, the brachot of Kriyat Shema, because she's not obligated to say Shema. Because every mitzvah that is limited to a specific time, women are dismissed. Why? Because they have an obligation to raise the children and to take, take care of the house. Since they are busy with mitzvah, and it's a constant mitzvah, all the other mitzvot that are limited to specific time, automatically they dismiss. With an exception of Shabbat. Shabbat is a different story. Shabbat appears in the Ten Commandments twice. One time, Shamor et Yom HaShabbat. One time, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat. Shamor ve Zachor be dibur echad neemru. It's like Hashem say two words in the same second. Why is it? If it only says Zachor at Yom HaShabbat, women didn't have to keep Shabbat. But since it says Shamor, Shamor it's restriction. There's a specific restriction to women as well. But other than that, without it, they would not, will be dismissed from Shabbat, because Shabbat is limited also. It's once a week from this time to this time. But other than that, of course, every mitzvah that a woman does adds to her account. There's nothing to lose. Just remember to be careful with the, with the uh, brachot. Uh, it's a preparation for the accept acceptance of the Torah. The Zohar says if a person forgets one night, he has like a short, a shortage in his preparation for Matan Torah, which is going to be on the 49th day, from the exodus of Egypt until the acceptance of the Torah, seven times seven. Seven weeks preparation for Matan Torah. And if a person ha forgets one night, it's mainly like I say for the men, he has like a cut in his preparation of every day coming closer for the acceptance of the Torah. That's why you got to be very careful to try, at least according to Kabbalah, not to miss any day. If a person forgot to count the Omer at night, he can still count the entire day the next day until sunset without bracha. Because in a day you don't make bracha on, on Sfirat HaOmer. And then the following night, he continue with bracha as usual. If he forgot the entire 24 hours and the next night arrived, that's already stars outside, that's it. He can never make the bracha until Shavuot. So what's the solution? He stand in a shul next to someone. When he makes the bracha, he tell him, have me in mind. Because he cannot say the bracha anymore. Why? If you miss 24 hours, that's it. You lost, actually, because it's an entire one long mitzvah of seven weeks. Lag Omer, the 34th day of the Omer, Sfaradim already can shave, have haircuts. If they want to go according to Kabbalah, they wait until Shavuot, then the Erev Shavuot, before Shavuot, the day before Shavuot, they have a haircut, whatever, as preparation. It's up to you if you want to be machmir. Every time somebody asks you halacha, and you are machmir, which means you are strict. You like to be strict. You have to just make sure that you are, you are strict because you love Hashem and the Torah, and not because you, are, you have a high ego. 
Many of the people who are very strict, they're full of ego. And they're only strict in front of people. When they're alone, they're not so strict. Somebody like this is a hypocrite and a, and a faker. He doesn't have any, any reward of being machmir. You only have an extra reward if you do it for the sake of heaven. Most of the people I know, and I have a lot of experience with people, they are only machmir for the show off. Not only they won't get a reward, the Torah said that Hashem cannot stand people with pride. They're actually losing with all this show. I read in one of the books that someone who pray very, very long, not everyone, don't make mistake here. Some people are really for the love of Hashem. Uh, most of the people, because they, want to th they think while they're praying, I wonder what everyone think about me right now. That I'm such a tzaddik. Everyone pray five minutes and I pray 12 minutes. Wow. You know? I, I personally never saw one gdol ador ever that pray more than seven minutes. No one. Not Rav Eliashiv, not Chacham Ovadia, not Rav Ben Zion. There's hundreds of big Chachamim. Didn't see one of them. There are some Mekubalim who pray two hours. They do Kavanot HaRasha. It's, it's a different world. It's not for us. It's for very special people. They all day. They pray six, seven hours a day. That's a different story. You know, you saw the Sidur of the Rashash? It's not one Sidur. It's four. That means for every word of the Tefillat Shmona Yisri, you have a hundred words to have in mind. All the names of the Malachim, the angels. It's not for people, ordinary people. It's only for people who are very, very holy. They go to the mikveh every day. They learn all their life Torah. They finish the entire Gemara, Shulchan Aruch. They became big Mekubalim. That's a different story. We're not in this league. So all these people who live in illusion, they want to be like that. Let's land back to the land and forget about this illusion and be what Hashem expects you to be according to your level. The same thing people ask me a lot about Parnassah issues. The answer about Parnassah is different to every Jew. No two Jews have the same answer about Parnassah. Why? Because it's depending on what level you are in your emuna. Not everyone has the same emuna. One person, I would say, learn Torah all your life, don't worry about work. Do nothing. Hashem will take care of you. Another person, I say, learn, work very hard, and learn two hours a day Torah. So he will ask me, why you, my friend, you told him, don't, don't work at all, just learn Torah, learn Torah, and don't worry about anything. Don't worry about Shidduch, don't go to Shatchanim, whatever is supposed to come to you, Hashem will bring you special to your hand. And to me, you say, go be a slave, go work, kill yourself. Right? So the answer is, because you determine the way Hashem behaves with you, based on your level. The level, you're not born with this level. You born with the beginning level. But over the years, you can raise it a lot. You work on your emunah a lot. You come to a situation in your life that you're not worry one minute a month about your parnasa. You get the check, you don't get the check, people owe you, you don't care. Don't even check the account. I had a friend, Baruch Hashem, for a few years I didn't see or hear from him, but it used to be time he lived in Monsi, we were very close. His name is Rabbi Yaakov Stefanski. I say the name that you can go and check if it's true or not. One time his wife was a very big righteous woman. This story, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is around approximately 10 years ago, when his wife passed away. She passed away from the horrible disease. She was a principal in a school in Monsi. So hundreds of her students, girls, they all came. It was an, an unbelievable funeral. If a person wanted to know what a righteous person is, that funeral was to learn what, a, what an important person is. So after that, he came to me, and he said to me, I don't even know how to write a check. I've never been in a store one time since I got married. I was in his 50s, maybe 60s at that time. He said, I haven't been in a store for 30 years. Didn't step in a store. And he said, now, now I realize what does it mean to take care of the house, writing checks, money. Didn't know nothing about money. All I did is, you should see him with his small tefillin, always in the Mnetz Minyan, all the time with him and Hashem and the Torah. That was his life, a holy person. 
Now, she took care of everything. She walked out of the house. She took care of the house. She raised the children. And when she was dying, she said to him, what are you doing here? Sitting in a hospital. What are you doing here? You're wasting hours of Torah. Go learn. Don't worry about me. You're not a doctor. And now, he said to me, from all these years, five years I was in the attic. Just me and Hashem and the books. This is a, we can dream about this kind of levels, but I'm just showing you. She took care of everything. He said, I used to ask her from upstairs, you manage with the bills? She said, everything is taken care of. And we were months behind. She was making maneuvers, bringing money from there to there, not to collapse financially. And she always smiled to him, we're doing great. Why? She wanted him to learn Torah. Like Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiva, this is the Rachel of this generation. Now you ask me, so why did she pass away young? That's the typical question that everyone asks. It's not even a question. The Torah says, when a thousand or ten thousand Jews supposed to die, God forbid, Hashem is making a trade. He takes a righteous man or a righteous rebitzen or woman, and he takes him instead of ten thousand. Why? He's equal in his spirituality like ten thousand. That's the meaning of the Pasuk. Dodi Yarad Legano Lilkot Shoshanim. Dodi, it's a Kadosh Baruch Hu, it's in Shira Shirim. Hashem went to the garden from all the thorns out there, he picked up one rose. The thorns are the ordinary people or the wicked people that the world is full of. And one rose in the middle of all the thorns. Hashem picked up the thorn. And that's avoiding a tragedy of 10,000 people supposed to die in an earthquake or something. That keeps the Satan quiet for, a next, for the next year or two. Why? Because the Satan is an angel. When he comes in a bed in Shalmala, and he said there was an earthquake in Iran, 70,000 died. Why did you punish them for? So the Satan brings his case. They doing this, they doing that. Okay. Now you tell me, please, why the Jews are any better? The Satan came when we came out of Mitzrayim. This, the, the Dead Sea, the, the, the Red Sea did not split. The Red Sea did not split. The Jews were screaming to Moshe, well, why did you take us out of Egypt? The Egyptians are chasing us. Are we going to die soon? Why we need all this? So the Satan comes to Hashem and says, wow, look at them, look at your children. The Egyptian worshipping idols, and they're also worshipping idols. What does it mean? They don't even have a moon eye in you. They saw the ten miracles, the ten plagues in Egypt, and they still worry that they're going to die. After you promise them, you take them out, you give them the Torah, you bring them to Israel, they see all the miracles, they continue to cry. So why why they deserve to have this, uh, this beautiful salvation with miracles? They don't deserve it. They have to die. And what, uh, what was the problem? Hashem cannot answer, be quiet, it's my children, I love them. Because it's not justice. Justice is justice. Even if you're a judge, if your son is a criminal, you have to send him to jail. Even if your son, if you don't send him to jail, you're not a fair judge. You cannot be tomorrow a judge. No one will have faith in you. So justice is justice. It says, Asher lo isa panim velo ikach shochad. Isa panim means prefer one person from another. Even though there's no reason, they're both wicked. Why are you saving him and not him? It's called maso panim. With me, Hashem, there's no maso panim. So the Satan has a good point, and Hashem was mute. He didn't have what to answer based on justice. And who saved us? Nachshon ben Aminadar. One Jew saved the entire nation. He jumped in, and he showed, Hashem said to the Satan, you see, my children trust me, look. He rose in the water, whatever happened, happened. He knows the water will split. And everyone got saved. And there's many cases like this in life. So it's all depend on the emunah of a person. If a person doesn't have emunah, Hashem sends him to work like a slave, and not a job, and not a job, and he makes the money. Hashem help him 5%. He does 90, 95%. Why? Because in his mind, I am making the money. You make the money, you will make the money. But another person already realized long, long time ago that I'm nothing. Just dust in the wind, nothing. I just have to cry to Hashem. I need this, I need that. That's it. The rest, I do a little bit efforts, one phone call, one meeting. That's it. Hashem wants, he can send. 
if you live like this and you really believe it, how do you know if you believe or not? How? Many people hallucinating. hallucinating. They think, oh, I'm like that. I trust Hashem. If one check bounces for $100, they're ready to kill the person. What do you mean you trust Hashem? You run after a person for $100, you wait for him, where, when he's going to come, where is he? Where? <laughs> You're looking for him in the streets of Brooklyn like crazy. Oh, what am I having Hashem? Or somebody didn't pay you the rent, a widow, you're ready to throw her to the street with her orphans. What emunah you have in Hashem? You have emunah in Hashem? Or you go to the supermarket, $3.99, $4.19. Okay, put it back, go all the way, 20 minutes to save 20 cents. Coupons, driving, that, five different supermarkets. What emunah you have in Hashem? You don't have any emunah in Hashem. You have emunah in Hashem? You care about five dollars, three dollars, you kill yourself wasting so much time. You will never do it. Also, when you learn Torah, one person sits and learns Torah, you come and say, we need somebody to work. You're looking for a job? So he says, how, how much an hour? Tell him ten dollars an hour. <laughs> ah, for ten dollars an hour, I'm going to close the Gemara. So you say to him, okay, okay, you're right, twenty dollars an hour. Okay. So how much the Torah worked for him? Twenty dollars an hour. That's what Hashem gives him in Olam Abba. Twenty dollars an hour. He comes to his friend. Two hundred dollars an hour. Get out of here. Two thousand an hour. Two thousand? Wow. One day I'm gonna work. I can learn for five years. He has calculation. Okay. So the Torah worked for him two thousand. And then another person, you say to him, a million dollar an hour. You came to Chacham Ovadia or Chacham Ben Zion Abba Shaul. Tell him a million dollars an hour. Close the Gemara. Are you normal? It's not even a question for him. If Hashem wants to send me the money, He needs to send me the money by me not learning Torah. That's the only way He can send me the money? Just remember the person who I told you before that sends the email. Now I remember exactly what's the sentence that changed his life. Oh, now it came to me. He said to me, one sentence you said changed my whole life. What? You say, it cannot be. I didn't say it. It's the Torah say. It just heard me saying it. It cannot be that a Jew will do something that Hashem is happy with, and in return, he's going to lose. It never happened before, and it will never ever happen. That you do something that makes Hashem happy, like learning Torah, helping the poor, doing all kinds of things. And because of that, not only you're not going to, to gain, you're going to lose. And how many people thinking by me going to yeshiva, I'm going to lose? 99%. That's why they don't come to yeshiva. You ask, you go to the people. There are a lot of religious people. Not religious people that don't believe in the Torah. It's a different story. I'm talking from people. Business people, people who are in business, going to work, drivers, teachers, whatever. You come and say, leave everything, come to yeshiva. So you're thinking, oh, I'm going to be so poor. What am I going to eat? I'm not going to go on Pesach to the hotel for eight days. You know, how, how life going to be? Horrible. That's how he thinks. It's not coming to yeshiva. But in reality, if a person understands how Hashem works, in the long run, yes, there is always going to be a test, maybe a month, two, three, five. But in the long run, it cannot be that in the end, bottom line, that I lost anything from doing something that makes Hashem happier. And of course, everything is with that Torah, which means some people are not able to sit and learn all day. Either they don't have the brain for that, or that's not their purpose in life. So you need your rabbi that knows you very much to tell you, yes, you, can, you should go and learn Torah. You should work half a day and learn half a day. You should learn two hours. You should learn Gemara. You should not learn Gemara. Not everyone should learn Gemara. If it's a balabait, that anyway his brain is not working, and he works very hard, and he has an hour or two to learn Torah, you don't tell him sit and learn Gemara. He's going to go crazy after one year he finished one page. It's going to go crazy. It's going to say, well, there's thousands of pages. One year I learn, I come every day, I find parking, I go crazy, I fall asleep in the middle of shiur, I finish half a page of Gemara. It's mentally, you destroy him. You don't do it. It's very stupid to tell him, learn Gemara. Even Nadaf Yomi, why do you tell him? 
I tell you every day you learn the parasha of the Shavua have seven olim. Every day you learn one aliyah. With Rashi, you understand the Chumash very good. That's the foundation. After all, the Chumash is the foundation of everything. Before the Gemara was written, before the Mishnah was written, before Shulchan Aruch, before the Nevi'im, the foundation of everything is the Torah, the Chumash. Every Jew must know the Chumash, everyone, men, women, children, genius, and people with no brains. Everyone has to know the Chumash. People with no brains, Hashem doesn't expect them to learn Gemara with Tosfot. He understands their, their uh, limitations. But everyone has to know Chumash. Everyone. That's the foundation. Since many Baalei Tshuva didn't go to Yeshiva, they have a serious gap. They don't know the foundation. Right away, they throw them to Gemara. They don't know Chumash. They don't know the meaning of the Tariyag Mitzvot. I made a whole series, Tariyag Mitzvot. It saves a lot of time to people because they never learn this mitzvot. There's a lot of mitzvot. Half of them, nobody heard of. All the korbanot, all this ordinary religious Baal Tshuva. You think he knows all the differences between the korbanot? He knows all the korbanot of the holidays? He knows all the halachot of Shah? He doesn't know all this. He doesn't know. That's why you have to know the foundation. So he has to learn every day the aliyah of that day, seven days a week. In one week, he'll finish the whole parasha. If Friday he has time, a few hours, let's say he doesn't work or he has half a day, so he can learn on Friday the entire parasha. One way or the other, the most important things for a person like this, he has to learn chumash, alachot, he has to take alachot in his language, to his level, not the original Shulchan Aruch from 500 years ago that he doesn't understand anything. In his language, Russian, Persian, Arabic, English, whatever, in his language to learn daily halachot, 10, 20, 30 halachot every day, depending on how much time he has. After a few years, he knows all the halachot. He goes to yeshiva. He finds Baalet Shuvah who learned Gemara for 10 years. He knows better halachot than them. And he's selling vegetables in the market. And they ask halacha, and he knows better than them. Why? They know a lot of Gemara, but they don't know the foundation. Should you be surprised? This is what's going on here today. So he has to know halachot, chumash, if he has extra time, mishnayot, mishnah. And then only if one day he retires, then he goes and learns Gemara all his life. And there's one more thing. He must learn musar every day. Minimum 15 minutes, Musar. Even if he's a Rosh Yeshiva. Even he goes with a long frock and his beard is touching the floor when he walks. He still have to learn 15 days Musar. And even if he reads this Musar for the 10,000 times in his life and thinks, <laughs> I know it by heart, doesn't matter. Just when you know it in your subconscious, it's not active in your everyday life until you read it again. You have to read it again and again and again, and it makes an impact on you. Or you listen in a car. When you drive, you take like the Path to the Just series. You have 30 hours there, 15 minutes a day. That's already enough for the whole year. Musar, it's all Musar. Or the Pirkei Avot series, another year of Musar. There's lots of Musars on the CDs. You know, depend on your level. Some people like very strong Musar. Some people like fake Musar. You know, half an hour, beautiful stories, one minute, Musar, okay, one minute I can live with. You know, whatever. People like to, you know, one of the problems here today, that since we are more or less, almost all of us are fakers, let's admit it, some to higher level and some to lower level, but we fakers. We fake, we lie to ourselves, we live in a lie, the lie is sweet. We even convince ourselves that we are minimum Chacham Ovadia, each one of us. <laughs> oh, she thinks that she's Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiva. When she, she did not had even one hour of her life in real modesty. But she thinks I'm the biggest rabbit son in Flatbush. Because she never learned halachot of tzniyot. She thinks, compared to my friends from Yeshiva, I'm the only one that my skirt is below my knees. So she thinks, I'm a mamash a big tzaddik. In reality, even her is not passing the red line. So she thinks, okay, if I'm in trouble, everyone is in trouble. You're right, but it's not going to save you. 
What do you think? Now, chas v'shalom, God forbid, there is a serious epidemic of cancer everywhere. There's not one hour I don't get a new name on my cell phone. Not, not one hour. Every hour, a few names. Non-stop. There's an epidemic right now. It's like a Russian roulette. It looks like it. Who knows if I'm not next? That's how, if a person is hearing and is involved with the public, he can get paranoid from how many names he hear every day. And all other problems and tragedies and heart attack, who Hashem irachem. So if one person found out that he has it, and he goes to the hospital and he finds 300 people in beds like this, does it comfort him in any way that he joined them? So everyone is in this problem. What does it help you? Everyone fell in college and did not become a doctor. Does it change your life? You still lost five years of time and you did not pass the test. You wanted to be a doctor and you won't. Just because five more thousand people fell, so it's supposed to make you feel better? It's very foolish. Very, very foolish. Now I tell you about something that happened. This is all questions in reality. Let's go one by one. One person went to shul, and he saw an Arab thief coming out of the window of the shul with a Sefer Torah in his hand, stealing the Sefer Torah. He's thinking, 30,000, I sell it for 5,000. So he runs, and a Jew saw it, so the Jew started to scream, Ganav, Ganav, a thief! So he started to run after him and scream, like more people would join the chase. So the Arab saw, he realized that another minute maybe people will, will catch him, so he threw the Sefer Torah on the floor, and he ran. So now this Jew picked up the Sefer Torah, now he asked a question, we have a rule, if we see a Sefer Torah is falling, every one of us is in a guilt for it. If we all saw it in a Chaz V'Shalom in a Shul, the person who knocked it down from his hand is the most guilty one. But if there are a few here in the audience that did not deserve to see such a horrible thing, it wouldn't happen. We'll get saved from it. So the fact that we all participate in that event, and it's fair, we have to fast. Now he's asking, indirectly, I was the reason that it fell. So do I have to fast? Or not only I don't have to fast, I deserve a reward for saving the Sefer Torah of being in Gaza. Or maybe they burn it. Who knows what he stole it from? What do you think? Huh? It's a good question, no? So the answer is... Many halachot that says the respect of the Torah, sometimes a person will do something that would look, chas v'shalom, disrespecting the Torah, but it's actually for the, for the sake of the honor of the Torah, which over here. Over here, he did something like sacrifice his time and efforts to run to save the Torah. He didn't tell him to throw it on the floor. So obviously, not only does not need to fast, it deserves a big yeshar koach, a very big yeshar koach. That means a compliment for, a compliment for saving the Torah. We're going to learn from these questions and answers that I'm going to say now about many things that happens to us every day. There's a person who's stuck in traffic now. And he think, I'm late for a big shiur. I have a big lecture, 200 people waiting for me in a shul. I'm stuck here in traffic, and they say on the radio that there's a two-hour delay. Now he has people waiting for him. That reminds me, one time I went to Miami Beach. So the lecture was supposed to start at 8, 8.30, I think. And I was supposed to land in Miami Beach around 5.36, something like that. Well, plenty of time before the lecture. And there's a guy waiting for me in the airport. There was a very, very rainy hurricanes there. Clouds, rain, storms. Miami, it happens sometimes. So the plane, a two, two and a half hours flight, already five hours we in the air, and the plane is not landing. And everyone asks, what's going on? You know? And I say, 
There's no way to land. I'm waiting for the weather to become better. So now I'm thinking to myself, wow, it's almost already 8 o'clock. Now by the time I land, until I get out, until we get to the lecture, I'm already minimum half an hour late, as it is. And there's no way to call. And the, the poor driver is waiting from 5.30, it's already 8 o'clock. And you don't know what's happening. You're thinking all the pressure of the people come all the way for nothing. You miss the night, what is all this flight for? Then after two and a half hours, the pilots say, we have to go to some island, five hours driving from Miami Beach, the end of Florida somewhere, a small airport, size of one block here, that's the airport. We have to go to that island over there, whatever, to land over there because we're out of gas. And over there, there's no storm, five hours away. So he has to go and land over there. So he land over there, I look at my watch, nine o'clock. I'm thinking, until they put gas, until it takes off, until we go back to Miami, it's already 10. Then until we get to the lecture, 10.30. Who's gonna left there? That's it, the night is over. <laughs> my heart is burning. So we're there. Bottom line, what time I got to the lecture? 11.30. And there's still more than 100 people waiting there from eight o'clock. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Unbelievable night. Got there at 11. So over here, now this one is stuck in traffic. And he's thinking to, my, to himself, well, how am I going to get there? So he called up 911 in Israel. And he said, I need an ambulance. What is he thinking? He says, I'm going to lay down on the street here, pretend that I got a heart attack. And they will call an ambulance, and then the ambulance will get me out of this highway, with the siren. Once he gets me out of the highway, I've got to tell him I feel better, <laughs> get down, quickly take a cab and make it to the lecture. If not, I'm stuck here for two hours. The only one who can take me is the ambulance. So he's allowed to do it? He said, I have a reason. The Torah. Limut Torah keneget kulam. The Torah is the most important thing. Gadol Talmud Torah. Yoter me'atzalat nefashot. The Torah say, learning Torah, it's in a higher level than saving physical lives of people. So next time before you think about joining Hatzalah, better you learn five minutes Torah a day, it's better than working all day in Hatzalah. Not that Hatzalah is not important. What can be better than saving life? Only one thing. Two things. One is learning Torah. And something even greater, saving souls, which means making Jews religious. That's the highest level. Why it says, Kola Matzil Nefesh Achat Mi Israel, Kilu Itzil Olam Umlo. Someone who saved the soul, it's like saving the entire world. Because one soul can turn into the whole world. Who can prove to me that it's right? One soul. Cain and Hevel. Cain killed Hevel. Cain stayed. How many people you have today in the world? Seven billion. Started with one person. Adam, Chava, Cain and Hevel. Cain killed Hevel. Hashem said to him, the blood of your brother is screaming to me from the ground. So Chazal asked, why the blood? The blood? Because all his children, grandchildren, grand-grandchildren are screaming why we cannot come to the world to do our correction because of this murderer. <laughs> now I want to ask you, Cain is a murderer that murdered on purpose or not on purpose? What do you think? If today we had to judge him in a bed din, in Sanhedrin, let's say we had Bet Amikdash, we have to bring Cain and judge him. We have to execute him like a murderer, or we have to send him to a shelter city, Ir Miklat. Ah, what do you think? Cain would claim, how am I supposed to know that taking a rock and hitting someone's head make him fall asleep forever? I never saw something like this ever happen. Nobody ever taught me what that is. If I saw some, an incident like this happen, and I repeat it, stabbing a person and he see he dies, but I saw that it happens before, then I don't have an excuse. But now I didn't know. There's nothing we can do. 
because he can, can complain that I got angry. I didn't know that people die from it. Today we know. You cannot find the uh, tricks. But he didn't know really. That's why Hashem made him a sign. I will be somehow protected. So what do you think? Is he allowed to do this trick or not? The answer is, it's a very big sin to do. Very big sin. But why? Why is it? That's called deceiving. Deceiving, there's no permission in the Torah to deceive anyone, anywhere, anytime. Except one thing, who knows when. When you're allowed to deceive a person, if a person is a very big, wicked person, today, what I'm going to say now, doesn't apply today to anyone. So relax. Don't code it in my name tomorrow to your friends. Just listen and get the point. But it doesn't apply anymore. But in the old days, you had very righteous people and very wicked people. The wicked people couldn't claim, I don't know what Torah is. Everyone knew what Torah is. It wasn't like today. You have Jews, one from Russia, one from Siberia, one from Georgia, one from Poland, one from Germany. Never heard in his life one word of Torah. All of a sudden, 30 years old, he found out there's something like the Judaism. It's not the same. So if a very wicked person that knows that Torah is divine, who knows Hashem, but he decides to fight against the rabbis and against the Torah and hurt the Torah and do all kinds of bad things, molesting the people, robbing them, doing horrible things. If he goes down to a hole, a big hole in the ground, let's say 20 feet deep, with a ladder, and you come to him and say, can I borrow your ladder? I bring it back in five minutes. And he's looking up to you. Let's say he doesn't see your beard, because if you see your beard, he's allergic to you. He's not going to lend you the beard. He, he, he didn't know who you are. It's, the, the sun is in his eyes. So he hears someone speak to him. Can I borrow the ladder? I'll bring it back in five minutes. He say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you take the ladder, you don't have to bring it back. You leave him over there to die. And you're not a murderer. You did a big mitzvah. That's when Hashem thinks. So ask me why today we can't do it. Because today, we do not know for sure who is falling into this category of a wicked Jew. We don't know. Sometimes it looks like they do, this is the most horrible Jew in the world. And somebody with a beard and yarmulke is worse in the eyes of Hashem than him. How can it be? Because maybe when he was a kid, he went to yeshiva and he had a horrible rabbi who was beating him up and torturing him and abusing him. And then when he went home, his mother was married to a very bad man, which was his stepfather, which was also abusing him. And every experience he had with religion was so horrible that he's mentally injured from this religion, what's called religion. There's thousands of people like this out there. I met a few hundreds of them. So he's so anti, whenever he hears the word religion, he's ready to murder. Not that it justifies being wicked. It's all excuses. But everybody understands that it's not the same of somebody who grew up in a house with harmony and Torah and beauty, and then he went and became wicked. It's not the same. So maybe this person is not as guilty, and Hashem will understand where he comes from. Rather, he see a very modern Jew that does whatever he feels like. But he knows 100% that he's sinning every hour of his life. And this person, he hates his life as it is. But he says, my head is messed up. They, they murdered me. I had one time a guy, Baruch Hashem, with Hashem's help, I finally made him Baal Shuva, but it wasn't easy. Why? Because it was almost impossible to convince him to come to Yeshiva even for one day. It was very, very hard work. Why? He told me that when he was a kid, he was a very, very problematic kid. And there was no Ritalin, you know, in those days. So his Rebbe, I don't know what kind of Rebbe is that. He took him from his jacket and hung him on a hanger, like this. He was a little kid. That's from that moment on, he hates Torah. 
You ask, what's the connection? There's no connection. You have a wicked Rebbe. That's not what the Torah says to do to children. It's a very big sin. But for him, a kid doesn't know that the, between good and bad and the truth and false. He doesn't know. For him, that's what's going to be in his memory forever. That's the face of the Torah. That's why Chilul Hashem is such a big sin. That making other people, like today, many people say, how come we hear on the news so many frauds by religious people, frauds, these, Fonzi schemes, all the time. What's going on? Why? Who knows why? Why you didn't hear about it 50 years ago and today you hear about it every day? People with yarmulke and beards. How can it be? Man, they don't know the Torah say should not steal so many times. What do they think? That Hashem is blind? What's go through the mind of these religious people when they rob millions of dollars from innocent people? They even rob yeshivot. What do you think? They care? In the beginning, they rob the enemies of Israel. They feel good with that. Then he goes to the lovers of Israel. Then he goes to Israel. Then he goes to the chief rabbi. They steal from him and they sleep well at night. Because the Satan always makes you go lower and lower. In the beginning, oh, that's not such a big sin. Ah, he's an anti-Semite guy. It's not a sin. Good, good. Steal from him. Better. If you don't steal from him, he gives the money to the Hezbollah. Mitzvah to steal from him. That's how the Satan starts. Then once you get used to it, then he comes to an innocent goy, which is a lover of Israel. Ah, it's a goy, it's no difference. Then from that goy, he says, what's the difference? What's the difference between this goy to the Jew? Same body. So he starts with the Jew. And then he says, what's the difference between the Jew and the rabbi? They both put fill in. Big deal. I did for me, I'll do for me. And that's what happens. That's all the time what's happened. So the point is, the point over here is, that it's called la petach chatat rovetz. Once you open the door a little bit to the dog, he's in. Then you cannot convince him to leave the house. He runs around. You can't get rid of him. The problem was to let him in. That's called la petach. Chatat, it's the name of the Yetzirah. The Gemara said the Yetzirah has seven names. One of them is chatat. La petach chatat rovetz. So what happened? It says... Once you're starting, there is no end to it. So the answer to this, why we hear about it so much on the news, the answer is because we became so goyish in our lifestyle, so goyish, that we actually behave like the goyim. We behave like goyim. We behave much more like the goyim of 50 years ago than like the Jews. Much more. The way we dress, the way we talk. The college, everyone, college, college, degree. You must be educated. Without it, you're not going to have what to eat. Vacation. Wow. One year without three vacations? I'll commit suicide. Vacation, show off expensive watches, bow tie, gel in his hair, takes the yarmulke out of his pocket, come out of his private jet, the limo is waiting, a private helicopter. Why? So he become like a goy. In his nature, he's a goy. Yeah, his, his father was the haham of the town. But he's a guy. He's pretending he's religious. But he's not. We almost all of us like this. That's why you hear on the news 50 million scam, 100 million scam. Just uh, on the news now, if you hear the news, 120 million scam. A person with a beard, they show him with his stride. That's a chilul Hashem like this. But that's the problem right now that it's not already killing us anymore. Fifteen years ago, if you heard something like this on the news, you couldn't sleep for a week. I, I you know myself, myself. Fifteen, seventeen years ago when I heard something like this on the news, I was sick for a week. Going like crazy. Wow, what an embarrassment. Wow, the whole world see a guy with a beard like this on the news. Now, since we hear about it every hour, every day, we, we eat our heart for one hour, and that's it. It's over. It's over. Same thing if 50 years ago you heard about a cancer that someone has, you couldn't eat for a week. Wow, a Jew suffering in hospital, needles, this, that. Today, since you hear about it every hour, retailing for this, retailing for this, based on the amount of things, you cannot leave the tailing one minute of your life because you get so many messages. Same thing doctors. When they join the hospital, first day and they see a patient die, you know how upset they are? 
come back to the same hospital three years later. Somebody just died, he goes outside. Yes, okay, so did you make the wire? What happened? Three years ago he went out and he was crying. What happened, doctor, you okay? Wow, I just saw a patient of mine died. He couldn't eat that day. Three years later he got used to it. He see it every hour. That's right, see people dead. That's what's happening. Doesn't feel it. That's why it's very hard to be a doctor. If you're a doctor, you can either end it up as the most righteous person on earth, or you can end it up as Chaz Shalom, the most wicked person on earth. It's a very hard test. The Gemara say Abba Umna was a doctor. Abba Umna. The Gemara say I think it was Abaye. Every week Hashem comes to him and whispers something hello to him in his ear. He hears like an echo. Ruach HaKodesh. But this Abba Umna has it every day. He said, how can it be this doctor in his doctor office and I'm the big Chacham of Israel and Hashem say hello to me once a week and to him every day? How can it be? So he started to follow him. He sent people to private detectives. So he saw this Abba Umna when men and women comes to him, first of all, he doesn't make a mix in his office between them. Second, when he treats a woman, he has a special, very modest thing for her to, to wear. And whatever, let's see if they, they used to put leech. It's like instead of today, like a blood transfusion and all kinds of things, they used to have these animals like called leech, blood suckers. They suck the blood. And it, it makes some of the blood comes off the body, and then the body creates new blood, which is very good to replace the blood every once in a while. So when they used to do it, so the, the kilt, this special uh, gown, whatever you want to call it, had a very little tiny hole exactly where it needs to treat, that it won't be a modesty issues. That it's going to be only to treat where it needs, and the rest is fully covered. <laughs> no, is that a reason that Hashem comes to him every day? One more thing he had. What was it? When the poor people came, he knew some of the people cannot afford the treatment. So he didn't charge. He said, whoever, this is the prices, whatever you have, go on over there, there's a little room, put whatever you can afford in the basket and go. That's how it was. That was something very big. Very, very big. The Gemara says, I don't know if it's a Gemara or Midrash, I read it a few years ago, that Rabbi Shimon saw in his dream that in Olam Abba is going to be together in the same section with the butcher with a caterer. That's really what it was. Caterer. Imagine you come to the chief rabbi of the world and you say, Rabbi, we have good news for you. What? In heaven, you and XYZ catering, you know, that makes all the parties, will be in the same level. <laughs> the rabbi is going to pull his hair off. Wow, what did I do wrong? <laughs> what did I do wrong? It was very curious. He wanted to know what's so special about this caterer has to be something. So he went to his house for a week to follow him. He said, can I stay by your house? I have no place to go. He said, sure, here, no problem. So he was in his house. He follows him. He sees nothing special. He's an ordinary religious Jew. He goes to Tfila, fine, he pray, he make Birkatam, nothing special. He walks, he learns a little bit. That's the same thing like me that knows the whole Torah and teach the whole Torah to Israel. How can it be? So before he left, he said, tell me, tell me what's your secret. You're a very important person in heaven. Tell me what's your secret. So, so he said to him, no, I don't have any secrets. I'm not just an ordinary person. So he said to him, you had to do something great in your life. Tell me, tell me, tell me about yourself. So he said to him, the caterer, the only thing I can think of is that, that you know, one time a, a captain of a, of a boat, a goy, he told me, I have something very special to sell to you. And I said to him, what is it? He said, I cannot tell you. But trust me, it's something that you're going to want to buy very much. So he told him how much. He told him 100 coins of gold. I don't remember the numbers. It's not relevant, just to get the idea. So he said to him, OK, if you say, I trust you, I do business with you. If you say that uh, 100 a hundred coins of gold will get me good merchandise, I'll buy it. I'll trust your word. So the guy saw that he's, uh, he's buying the idea. I said to him, no, no, actually, in a second thought, 200. 400. 
Believe me, it's still worth it for you. Okay. He follow him, he gives him the money, he takes him to the boat. In the bottom of the boat, the boat has a basement. It's covered with a big piece of, uh, of uh, material, whatever. The captain pick it up. You see over there, 200 Jewish boys and girls in handcuffs, all of them like this, freezing. They're all kidnapped from their country. They brought them to this country now. They're all orphans. They want to sell them to the Goim to be slaves. So he came to the Jews, say, give me this money, like ransom, and redeem them. Say, take them all, 200 people, boys and, girl, and girls. So he took them all to his house. And he has a son. This, this caterer has a son. So what happened? He started to make them work for him, and he gives them food. It's not easy to, to feed 200 people. So, you know, whenever they mature, he makes a match, match between them. This boy, this girl, okay, and he helps them to make a wedding, and he relieves them. And another couple, and another couple. And there was one very beautiful girl that he wanted for his son. It was very nice, modest, you know, great girl. So he, he decided to get her engaged with his son. So he saw that she sits like this, she's quiet, she's a... So he told her, why you said, why? She said, I, I know, uh, how can I tell you this? You know, you did so much for us. You saved our life. You feed us. You raised us. But I already love somebody else. And I had the plans when I be ready to marry another guy. And uh, we already promised to each other that we're going to get married. I already engaged her to his son. She was embarrassed to say anything. So he said to her, but you know, maybe you reconsider. And I try whatever he can. She, she said, what, what, can, what do you want me to tell you? You want me to, tell you, to lie to you and tell you that my heart will be happy? I'm already in love with another, another one of the guys here. So he said to Rabbi Shimon, so what could I do? I asked my son to forgive me. It was a misunderstanding. And I made this couple married, and I paid for the wedding, and I helped them to move in together. That's, the, that's what I did. So he told him, Ashrecha, how lucky I am that I have the merit to be with you in Olam Abba in the same level. That's a man. That's a hero. Not only he didn't get angry at her, he also helped her to get married. He paid for the wedding and helped them to move in after she didn't want his son. This is sometimes, this is what the Rav Volbi in Aleshur, Rav Volbi, the big tzaddik, he writes in Aleshur, everyone knows Torah, 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 but sometimes a Jew has an hour of his life, not necessarily Torah, one test, and that's why he came to the world for. And also he says that there is sometimes a person that his way to connect to Hashem is through other things, like chesed, chesed, helping, helping the poor catering, being a butcher, being a mohel. That's his life. That's what his purpose in life. And for that, Hashem put him here. So if he was sitting all his life and learning and not doing the Brit Milah as he's supposed to do, he wouldn't fulfill his mission. So how do you know? This is the hardest question in life. How do I know what Hashem wants for me? To learn all day, to learn half a day, to learn an hour, to give donations, not to work, to learn, to receive donation. Well, how do I know? To teach, not to teach, to sit in yeshiva and learn for myself, or to go and give lectures? It's a lot of questions in life. To live here, to live in Israel, to live in Europe, to live who knows, to live in Zimbabwe. There are Jews in Zimbabwe. I always used to say somebody from Zimbabwe came, and then this week my wife brought a cookbook. She said, look at the community in Zimbabwe. I said, Zimbabwe? She said, yeah, there's a shul in Zimbabwe. There's Jews everywhere. Why there are Jews everywhere, you know? Where does it say in the Torah? Ve'efatzti etchem ba'amim. I will spread you all over the world. Ve'nishartem be'metei mispar. Only very few of you, only very few of you will survive over there. But everywhere in the world, there will be Jews. Even in Afghanistan, there were two Jews. Two. 
when they went over there for uh, whatever, the war, United States, they found two Jews, two shuls, two Jews. And they had a fight between them. <laughs> you know the joke. There's a bunch of Jews landed in an island. So they saw a Yemeni Jew over there. Say, oh, Mahu Hashem, there are Jews in this island. So they say to him, tell me, Saadia, there are other Jews here? He said, no, I'm alone here. So he said, I guess there's no shuls here. He said, why not? I build a shul. It's halakha to pray in a shul even by yourself. It's better than to pray at home. Even without minyan, you don't have minyan, still better in a shul. House of Hashem. Torah, this, Kedushah of the place. So, oh, Baruch Hashem, now with us, we finally have minyan. So they come to the shul. <laughs> they see across the street another shul. So they say to him, you say you're alone here in the island. He say, yeah, don't worry, I also build that shul also. <laughs> so why you build two shuls? He say, over there, I'll never pray. <laughs> it is a place to hate. <laughs> Otherwise, without politics, how can he survive? <sighs> Time is running out on us. There's a famous thing in our communities. I spoke about it a few times in the past. People who their parents passed away, they want to do something for their memory of their soul. Le'ilui nishmat. There's a mistake. What they write in English as a memory of, or memorial for this soul, it's not what the Gemara means, le'ilui nishmat. Memory of is one thing. Le'ilui neshama, it means to elevate the soul spiritually into a higher level in the afterlife. It's two different things. Memory, you can have a memory of Hitler. You remember him, for bad. Can be for good, can be for, good. for bad, depends. But you may, it's a memory. We have a museum of the Holocaust. Because we don't want any Jews to remember, to forget what they did to our fathers. It's a bad memory, but it's a necessary memory. So memory is not necessarily something good. Especially if the father of this person wasn't a tzaddik. Maybe he was a bad person, maybe he was wicked, maybe he was anti-Torah, maybe he was who knows what. Thief, who knows? So what's the point of having a memory of a wicked person? What's the point? Better to forget his memory. So the answer is, we're not doing it for his memory. Whether he was a tzaddik, whether he was a rasha, it doesn't matter. We are doing it to elevate his soul. Whether he was nothing, whether he was a very big rabbi, one way or the other, everyone can go up in the afterlife. But the difference is that they now need us to help them. Not only us, they can still go up on their own if they do what I said before. If they taught Torah and they build yeshivot, and they made Baalet Shuvah, they will bring to them profit every year. They don't need you. With or without your Kaddish, they go higher and higher every year. But the Kaddish, it's an obligation, if it's your parents, so you do it. But besides the Kaddish, there is a very interesting epidemic that all of a sudden, everyone becomes wealthy after his parents passed away, even if they did not leave him any Yerusha, they didn't leave him. Somehow, everyone finds their money under the, the floor to make a Sefer Torah to the Ilui Nishmat of the father or the mother or the brother or the son, whatever the case is. So how much is going to be? Depend. If you go to a poor community, to any 5,000, it's an average price. Yeah, they, put, they do a wood cover, you know, it's not so expensive. If you come around here in, in Brooklyn, it can go up to $80,000, a Sefer Torah or more. Just sometimes the cover alone is $20,000. Special, silver, rubies, whatever they put over there. So everyone thinks, wow, we do Achnasat Sefer, Sefer Torah to the Shul. What can be higher than that? We wrote Sefer Torah for the Ilui Neshama of my father or whatever. It's a very big mitzvah. Well, the question is, is it a real mitzvah, a real big mitzvah, or is it only a very tiny mitzvah? Let's see. The Gemara says in Masechet Megillah, page Chaf Zayin, "Mochrim Sefer Torah k'dei l'ilmot Torah." We are not allowed to sell Sefer Torah. Only for few exception to the rules. One is to save a Jew from jail. They go in, put him in jail, like in Russia. They used to just stick to a Jew and to Semite, put him in jail for no reason. 
Now, one person comes to the rabbi, rabbi, if you get me 100,000 rubles, we'll get him out. Right. So now it's mitzvah to redeem him. But what happens if the community doesn't have the money? They have, let's say, three sifre Torah. They want to sell one to a different town. They're allowed to sell the sefer Torah to get the money to save the Jew from the handcuffs or from the dungeon where he is. Or in a war, prisoner of wars. Okay. It's only with an exception if he doesn't keep Tarat Mishpacha. If he doesn't keep Tarat Mishpacha with his wife, not allowed to redeem him. Only if he's not Shomer Shabbat, you can still save him, even though he's like a, like a goy in Halakha. But still, he can make tshuva and become a Jew any minute. We're still saving him from the jail. But if he's not, sh- if he's not Shomer Tarat Mishpacha, that means right now the fact that he's in jail, he's getting saved from his Surah Karet every day because he cannot be with his wife, because he's in jail. If we redeem him, we're going to destroy him, because every time he's going to be with his wife, is worse than being with his own mother, according to the Torah. If a person go with his wife not pure, without going to the mikveh, it's a bigger sin than being with his own mother. Most Jews don't know it, that's why they don't keep it. It's a very, very big sin. Nida ve'elishat benida tumata lo tikrav legalot ervata. He cannot get even near your wife when she's impure. The Torah says in Parashat Achare Mot, all the, all the Gilui Arayot sins, all the non-kosher, intimate relationship that are forbidden, are all listed. We read it in Yom Kippur in Mincha, which is the most important hour of the year. It's no coincidence why this is the reading before the Neila of Yom Kippur. To show you what Hashem is getting the angriest from all these crimes. All this uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, two Jews. Boyfriend and girlfriend. Two Jews, they think, oh, we're going to get married anyway. We Shomer Shabbos, we're from the community. Every time they're together, it's worse than being with his own mother. He doesn't know that. Why? Because it's a sin that is so correct from the Torah. And even if they make tshuva one day, later, when they finally open their eyes and see how, how horrible is this sin, they can never get rid of the suffering that they're supposed to get from that sin, even if they become Rabbi Akiva. They must receive suffering, sicknesses, problems, uh, jail, IRS, or who knows what. Must receive suffering. Why? Every one of the 36 sins in the Torah, that the Torah says, and that soul get cut out of my Jewish nation, Hashem say, in order for you to get connected, and must come through suffering. Can no, there's no other way. Even you pray, you donate billions of dollars, you become mamash Moshe Rabbeinu. You must receive suffering for all these surekarit. That's why boyfriend or girlfriend has no permission, no whatsoever. No, under no, there's no kula for that. Nothing whatsoever. So now, when are we allowed to sell Sefer Torah? to save a prisoner, and to learn Torah. Which means you own a Sefer Torah, but you cannot send your children to yeshiva to learn Torah. So you have two options. One, to keep them at home, and one, to send them to yeshiva, but you don't have the money. Public school, it's not an option. Not an option. People who send their kids to public school, oh, 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 oh. who is going to save these people when they come to their judgment day? I want to say to you, the reason we do not say in the Bar Mitzvah, Baruch Sheptarani Meonsho Shel Zeh, bless you that released me from the punishment of this boy, we were supposed to say it with the name of Hashem, Baruch Ata Hashem, Eloken Vumelech Haolam, Sheptarani Meonsho Shel Zeh. Bless you, God, like every other bracha. Why we don't say the name of Hashem? Because it's a lie. Because we cannot say, bless you, Hashem, for dismissing me or releasing me from the punishment of this boy. Why? We are not dismissed. We have to pay for the rest of our life and in the afterlife for all the sins that these boys do and the girls. Why? We send them to public school. We, we let them watch television. We fed them with non-kosher food. We show them the wife in the house how she dressed so her daughters learn from her how to dress not modest. Now he comes in a synagogue, half a million dollar bar mitzvah, $500 a person, you know, beautiful, everyone comes with a black tie. And he said, Rabbi, can I make the bracha? Baruch atah Hashem, Elokein, Shepta'ani, Mo'ot Shoshel Zeh. You can make a bracha on Eli? 
It's like taking a chazir, pig, pork, and say, Baruch ata Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam, Shetzivani lechol chazir. And he eats. What's going to happen to this person? The community vomit him all the way out. Would you marry your children to him? If he comes in the middle of Shabbat, he can bring pork. Baruch ata Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam, Asher kilishan v'tzvotat shan lechol chazir. And he begins to eat. If he does that, Rabbi, how do you let him in the shul? Right away, they make a petition. <laughs> Put signs all over. Be careful from, from this plony. So if a person comes in a bar mitzvah of his son, and he makes Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Sheptarani Meot Shoshel Zeh, it's a lie. You don't make a bracha on a lie, because you're not dismissed from the punishment. But one person made the bracha with the name of Hashem. Who? Rav Shlomo Zalman Oerbach. He wrote the book Shmirat Shabbat Ki Ilchata in the Bar Mitzvah of his son. Rav, Shlo, Rav Shmuel Oerbach is one of the important rabbis today. So he said in the Bar Mitzvah of his son, I know I didn't make one mistake with raising this boy. He said the name of Hashem. Well, we cannot say. Well, just enough, you give them all these karate game, game boys. This, that, all day. You, see, you walk in the house, you see your son come from Talmud Torah, all of a sudden under his eyes, black. What's this? So the other one say, he's imitating the football player. But how does he know about football? Football, six years old. Why? No, his father doesn't show him football on television. They don't have a television that's a full family. So how does he know? From the games. The games is a television show. What? What's over there? It's so real. They even show you all the dancers over there. So you're thinking it's only games. Baruch Hashem, we have some few hours of rest. They don't destroy our mind. All day, Abba, Abba, Ima, Abba. Give him the things. Four hours he sits. Baruch Hashem, quiet. Or some video. You'll see 20 years later the results of this. One thing I can tell you, only one thing. Even if it's perfectly kosher, every rabbi checked it, there's no pritzut there, nothing not kosher, nobody tell you you came from the monkeys, none of these things. <laughs> one thing there is already you losing. Who knows what? Perfectly kosher game. The rabbi designed it. Perfectly kosher. One thing you're already paying right away, the price. Who knows what? Tomorrow, he cannot learn Gemara anymore. He sits in a class, up to the day that he got this electronic game, he was learning very good. Now, the Gemara is not, import, not interesting enough. Compare this to this. Compare the ox, hit the sheep with his horns, and wow, who's going to pay to all this? Ha, ah, boom, ba, you know? Eh, forget about this. He's suffering in a class. Kosher games. That's it. He cannot learn anymore. <laughs> right or wrong? Try. Ask the boy if they learn better after they got it or worse. So it says like this. We're allowed to sell Sefer Torah to learn Torah. You cannot afford to go into yeshiva. You have a Sefer Torah and you're allowed to sell it. But to learn Torah, you sell the Sefer Torah. So what's more important? To learn Torah. So if you can make people in yeshiva learn Torah, or to bring Sefer Torah for the neshama, for the soul of your father or mother, what's a much bigger mitzvah? To make people learn Torah. How do you make them to learn Torah? Either you pay them money that they can sit and learn all month, or you give them the books, Gemara, Rambam, whatever they learn. You sponsor the books. Or you make them ba'alei tshuva, and thanks to you, they'll learn for the next 40 years Torah, which is much more important than buying a Sefer Torah. This is about Sefer Torah that will be used all the time. Shabbat, Monday, Thursday, holidays, Chol Moed. Here, it's much worse. Nobody will use your Sefer Torah. Go to any synagogue here and see how many Sifret Torah they have in a storage room. Once a year, they take it out to breathe some air that it won't get uh, green stale inside. 
once here they let the Sefer Torah breathe. Nobody will use it. Nobody uses it. It's like buying it and clucking it in your closet, in your bedroom. No one will use it. Why? Every shul has 20, 30, 80 Sifre Torah. Why? Every week, Achnasat Sefer Torah. And the Satan is dancing. Dancing from happiness. They tell the Satan, why are you dancing? There was another five Achnasat Torah, Achnasat Sefer Torah today in Flatbush. And another 15 in Borough Park. And another five in Monsi. And another 80 in Israel. Baruch Hashem, this month alone, 300 Achnasat Sifre Torah. Multiply by $50,000. Count how many millions of dollars every month goes. I don't want to set the garbage, but almost there. So the Satan is very happy. If we take that money and we invest it in the yeshivot, in Baalei Tshuva, in marriage crisis, in raising children crisis, in the drug epidemic, what would be more happy for Hashem? This or 5,000 Sifre Torah dusty in the closet? Huh? Until Chas Shalom, what history shows, every few tens of years or hundreds of years, another pogrom come or another holocaust come, Germany, Poland, whenever, all, almost in every country comes the goyim with their torches, and burn all the synagogues, and burn all the Sifre Torah, and even that goes completely to the garbage, and that's the end of it. That's what happened in history. Torah that people learn with your money, there's no way to delete. It's already sent, wired, to heaven. They burn, they don't burn, the person leave, die, doesn't matter. That's already in your pocket. Sefer Torah, you donate, and chas v'shalom, somebody comes and burn it, that's it. So if they use it for one month, and it got burned. That's it. So you have the reward of one man plus the donation. That's it. That's it. There's no more continuous basis. It's gone. You know the story of Margalit, the Yemenite woman. You remember I said a few years ago? You remember the story or no? Anyone heard that? Wow. Margalit Bat Avraham came from Yemen to Israel when Israel just became a state. When Israel became a state, there was uh, all kinds of, of diseases that people brought with them when they came to Israel. So they made a special isolated hospital. It's all insulations, you know, windows that nobody can go in because it's epidemic. It's contagious. It can kill the entire country. So people had leprosy in their skin, and this leprosy was contagious. So every person who came, the doctor examined them. If they see there's a risk, they send them to this hospital. So this Margalit, she didn't really have leprosy. She had some kind of a skin problem. It wasn't contagious. But they didn't care. She came with a Sefer Torah from Yemen. Probably worth fortune. Because the Yemenite has very antique handwriting from many, many generations ago. Even their Marot was on a scroll. I once gave a ride to one Yemenite guy in Monsi that uh, came to Monsi maybe 10 years ago. And he said that the Muslims stole all their things when they left Yemen. So he said, I had my grandfather Gemara on a scroll, 500 years old. Gemara on a scroll, probably worth millions. They stole everything. They didn't let them take it out. So we were smuggling some of the things, but the big things they took. No. So this Margalit somehow was managed to bring a Sefer Torah. So the, so the Zionists, the communists that were in charge to put the immigrants in the Ma'abarot, in places, and, and temporary places until they, they set them to work, it was all like Russian communists. You need a red card. If you don't have a red card, you cannot get a job. You have to believe in their nonsense, in communism. If you a little bit know the history of Israel, they all were Russian anti-religious people. That, that were in charge. They took advantage. They were very naive, very righteous, down-to-earth people. They were not educated in what's happening in the world. They only knew Torah and mitzvot. So I came from Yaman. They told them, ah, the Mashiach already came. No worry. So they took away her Sefer Torah. They say, when you come out of the hospital, we'll give it back to you. But she never came out of that hospital because once they pulled her in, she got it from somebody there. It's all contagious. She put her with other people that really have it. So now she got it for real. That's it. She's stuck there for the rest of her life. 
She was a young woman, never got married, no children, no nothing. So now she came to Israel. So one good thing was that they used to give money, like every social country, like America, they give food stamps, they give to people that they won't starve to death. So they give her money, X amount of money every month. So she decided to make a Sefer Torah. So she was saving for years the money, and she decided to make a Sefer Torah. She made a Sefer Torah, and she asked for a Yemenite Sofer in Bnei Brak to write a Sefer Torah. He wrote the Sefer Torah, and he brought it to a shul, Yemenite shul in Bnei Brak, and after one year, it got burned. She didn't know, she, was, she didn't hear what I just said. She only knew Sefer Torah, like most Jews, Sefer Torah, Sefer Torah, Sefer, that's all they know. So it got burned. So when she heard that, she didn't give up. One Sefer Torah they stole from her. One she donated, got burned. So she asked the Sofer, can you write to me another Sefer Torah this time, you lend me the money, and I'm going to make an order that all my social security payments will come directly to you for the rest of my life. Would you agree? He thought, great investment. You know, as long as she's alive, I'll make very big money. I'll take all her social security money. So she decided to do it. So she has no income at all, nothing. So one time, one Ashkenazi rabbi used to go to that hospital to visit the people, but you cannot go in. Even if they have to fill in, you have to burn it. You have to bury it. You cannot bring it out if you dare, has Vishon, because everything is contagious. So what happened? He hears the nurse, a cruel nurse, is taking care of this margalit. So by now she's an older woman. So she said to her, you stupid, you fool! Look at your socks! You don't have one normal socks. It's all full of holes. Is that my fault that you're stupid that you gave all your money for this Sefer Torah of yours? She said to her. So she, so she said, why are you all complaining? It's my problem, not yours. She said, no, but I have to take care of you and you're like this. You don't have what to wear even. So she said, well, when I came here, I never got married. I don't have children. One day I die, I did not leave anything in this world. The only thing I can leave in this world is a Sefer Torah that I donated. So what's better, that I'm going to buy socks, and then one day I die and I did not leave anything in this world, or at least I left something in this world? So he heard that. He went to Rav Yashiv. He told him what he heard. So if I remember correctly, Rav Yashiv said to him, this woman deserved to, to get the, the title Chatanit Torah, you know, in, in Simchat Torah we have Chatan Torah. He says she deserves to be Chatan Torah, and have to announce her name with the with the microphone all over Bnei Brak. That's what it's. This story, if I remember, I read it in Alenu Leshabeach of Rav Zilberstein. It's over there. It appears over there. Now, if this Margalit would know a little bit more Torah, it would be much better off for her to donate to learning of Torah. First of all, the Sefer Torah wouldn't get burned. And the money that she gave to make the first Sefer Torah that got burned would make a whole yeshiva learn for the whole year. Right? So already one year of millions of millions of mitzvot every month would already have by, will be in her account. And then the second Sefer Torah, instead of giving him the money to make another Sefer Torah, she would take that money and give it to yeshiva of learning Torah she would have trillions of mitzvot. And in the end, she left one Sefer Torah. But the good news is that she didn't know anything better. And there is a story that one boy came in Rosh Hashanah to the shul in Ashkenaz, and everyone was crying. I think it was Yom Kippur. Everyone's crying, crying to Hashem. And he's standing over there and whistling. Everyone got angry at him. What are you whistling now? What is music now? So the rabbi said, leave him alone. I saw now that our entire prayer got accepted because of this boy who was whistling. He didn't know how to read. He was ignorant. So because he did something from his heart, Hashem accepted our tefillah thanks to this ignorant boy. Or in the time of the Ariya Kadosh, there was a husband and wife who doesn't know anything. And they heard that the rabbi said that you have to do for Hashem 
So they decided to bake halot every Shabbat and come to the shul and put it inside the Aron HaKodesh next to the Torah, sacrifice to Hashem. Two ignorant husband and wife, 500 years ago. So one day, the Gabbai came on Friday. He opened the Aron Kodesh to prepare the Sefer Torah for tomorrow. He see two beautiful halot there. Ah, somebody wants to give me halot for Shabbat. Matan Baseter. He brings it home. His wife says, what's this? Say, someone is embarrassed to embarrass me. So he puts it, he knows I'm opening the Aron HaKodesh, so he leaves it for me over there. <laughs> How can he think that they thought it's a sacrifice to Hashem? So then he did, every week, and they come, they check, wow, Hashem accepted our, pray, our gift. They're happy, they're happy, they're happy, like this for a few months. One time he was very curious, who's giving me all these halot? He decided to hide. He was hiding there all day, all of a sudden he see these two, comes in, they bring the halot. So Hashem, thank you for taking our gifts every Shabbat. So he comes out, he says, you fools, you really think that Hashem was taking your halot? I thought you were giving me the halot. I was eating it every Shabbat. So they got so upset. So the Ari Kadosh had Ruach HaKodesh. He called him up. He said to him, you know, you're going to die because of what you did. Very soon. Saw it. He said, these two ignorant, they did from their heart for Hashem. Yeah, they don't know halacha. They don't know what Hashem needs the halot. But the intention... That their head was so pure, that's the only thing they did in their life for the sake of heaven. And you went and ruined it. That reminds me that the tzaddikim, when they see 30 days that they don't suffer, they begin to worry. 30 days. So what do they do? In the old days, there were no roads like today. So they used to go and pick up rocks, because they used to come with the horses, and they have wheels from wood. And if there's a big rock at night, it breaks the, the wheels because they are made from wood. And then you get stuck there for the whole day, try to fix the wheel. It's a big problem. Not like today, you call uh, Haverim. <laughs> Five minutes, Hasid come. One, two, three. I remember I came from LA, one of my flights, and we were in my suit, so exhausted, airport, six hours flight. Then I'm driving towards Monsi, I hear ta 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 in a tire, like a tractor. So, wow, ah, wow, that's what I need now. Palisades Parkway, there's a gas station right after the George Washington Bridge. I get to the Palisades Parkway, I see the entire tire got peeled off. And no, no rubber, that's it. it. All metals coming out. Cannot drive like this. Now, I don't remember when the last time in my life I changed the flat tire, and there's no haverim on the Palisades Parkway. So what do you do? I'm thinking to myself, now I'm going to ruin my whole clothes. But what can I do? I'm going to stay all night. It was very late at night, one o'clock at night. So I'm trying to see the tools. I don't have the right tools. Can't open the tire. So I said, I'm going to have to sleep here all night. I said, Shirla Ma'alot. I didn't even finish. Ezri meim Hashem. A minivan came. Five new square Hasidim. Jump. There is a store, there's a supermarket. You know, they sell kosher products. They come like this. One of them looks at me, see the depression on my face. You need help? I say, oh, so much. Get the tools. Dark, dark. Right away. You know, the Hasidim is like a network. <laughs> Two minutes later, another big car came. One guy with the professional tools. But this car was a stubborn car. I didn't have, a, I didn't have the right tire. He said to me, I'm afraid to put this tire. It can come out of the car. <laughs> All the experts. I said to him, you know, you're such a sadikim. Let's take pictures. We put it on the Facebook page. I had thousands of replies. People all over the world say, what a beautiful nation. Kiddush Hashem, the biggest I ever had. I took pictures with all of them. I said, look at this. Guys came from Hasuna from Brooklyn. They also were dressed nice. They come from a wedding. I saw a guy stuck. Right away, under the car, pulling the tire, all black. Nobody cares. Why? Me, I'm high Israel. Me, I'm high Israel. That's called Chesed. Olam Chesed Ivaneh. The foundation of the world is kindness, chesed. So the answer is, remember next time. 
when you invest in charity, there are different investments with different returns. Some return 1%, some return a million percent for the same amount of money. Always remember that before you do it. Bezrat uh, Hashem, next Sunday I'm going to be here. For those who came late, please check every Sunday if I'm in town or not. If you see no lecture, that means I'm not, I'm not in New York. Two weeks from now, I can tell you already I'm not going to be here. I'm going to Europe. So next Sunday I'm here, 8.30, it's the official time. I'm going to change it in the website to 8.30. We made three new CD collections. Number five, number six, number seven, 30 hours of lecture on each one. It's available on the website to order it. Only one dollar cost price. Order as much as you can and give it out. There's many different lectures on it. And Bezrat Hashem, any questions, anyone has any question, now you can ask about even things that we didn't discuss, if you have any questions right now. Oh, it was too long already. Yeah, go ahead. Just a little bit about Chalav Israel, if you could explain. Chalav Israel, it's halacha that in the old days, they didn't have refrigerator like today, and they didn't have milk in supermarkets like today, very convenience that you come and buy. And the people who used to sell milk were individual. There was no big factories like today that sell millions of liters of, uh, of gallons of milk. So the world was different than today. So if you needed to buy milk, you had to go buy it. Now, if you buy it from a goy, the goyim, when they used to sell their milk, since there was no refrigerator, the milk of a cow gets spoiled faster than the milk of a donkey or a camel. So different kinds of milk. So the goy knew that the Jews only buy milk from the sheep and from the cows. But since it's spoiled very fast, then he loses customers. Because the customers say, oh, his milk always spoiled. So what did they used to do? When the Jew turned his face, they used to take a little bit from the donkey that they always on the side, and they mix it, and it's like preservative. Like they have today all kinds of preservatives, so it makes the milk stay longer. That's why the Chachamim made the halacha, takana, that you can only buy milk that was supervised from the time of the milking until the time it was reaching the hands of a Jew by a rabbi or mashgiach, any kosher Jew who can testify that he watched the goy from the time he milked the, his cows until he sold it to you, he did not mix it with anything else. And that was hundreds of years ago, and it was all over the world, Jews bought only Chalav Israel. Today, it's very easy to get Chalav Israel. In every town you have Chalav Israel, in many supermarkets, so really there's no excuses. However, Rav Moshe Feinstein, one of the big Chachamim of America, maybe the biggest Chacham lived in America ever, he said that since the government here is very, very strict, and these companies that sell milk today are massive, huge, they make billions of dollars, the chance that they're going to mix different kind of milk with the cow milk that they sell is zero. They're never going to take a risk of losing their entire company because they lose their license in a minute if they find out they sold the donkey milk. So since there is the government who supervise them and they're afraid to lose their license, you can count on the milk that is OU, OUD. He was talking 30, 40 years ago when it was very difficult to get Chalav Israel in most of the places. So since it's very difficult, it's anywhere rabbinical law. So he was counting on the government who supervise all these places. However, perhaps if he lived today and he see how much Chalav Israel there is, he probably would not ride it. Probably, we don't know for sure. Those who live in places that is hard to get Chalav Israel and they want to count on this big Chacham, they have who to count on. But my advice is, it seems it's very easy today. It's very, much very easy to get Chalav Israel almost everywhere. You need a little sacrifice for it. It's better not to count on it. If you want to count, you have who to count on. Rav Moshe Feinstein has very wide and strong soldiers that you can lean on. Uh, one more thing is today. Today, it's much more expensive to get donkey milk or camel milk. It will cost them more money because there's no really factories that sell it. But the exception is that you saw what happened in Europe now. 
it wasn't permitted to sell horse meat. Everyone thought they buying cow milk, and in the end they were selling him horse meat. I don't know where they got horse meat, but it got into all the supermarkets in Europe. So, yes, it also was against the law. They can lose their license, and they still did it in Europe. And just to show us that even though the chance is very, very slow, very small, it can still happen. So that's called Chalav Israel, that it was supervised always by a mashgiach from the time of milking. Today, they found a solution with cameras. The mashgiach sits in an office and he sees with the camera all the time how they're milking the cows, so they know there's a camera on their head. That's also, some say you can count on this, that since they have cameras over there, so you can count on that, that they will never do anything with the combination of not losing their license to buy OUD milk. OU, for people who are not respecting OU, I want to remind every one of you that OU has the most religious rabbis in the world. It's not just another Ashgaha that came from out of nowhere. And many, many years in business, I know some of the rabbanim who works there, they big tell me the chachamim. And I say, you, you don't have to count on me, but if... You want to take my advice? Everything that all you give in Ashgacha, you can count on. I know some Hasidim say, no, it's not good enough. It's big Talmidei Chachamim in the OU. Big Talmidei Chachamim. I have a friend that I told him what I just told you. He didn't listen to me. And it was a Baal Tshuva, and he went to a house for, I don't know if it was Pesach or Friday night. And they told him, the Ashkenazim over there, they told him, can you make a kiddush? You want to make a kiddush? He said, okay. And he looked at the wine, and he said, as a whole, you ashgacha. And he said to him, do you have a different wine? And he said, wow, well, what's wrong with this wine? And he said, ah, it's only all you, so I'm not sure. Maybe you have a better ashgacha, like some chassidish hechsher. So they saw that everyone looked at one man over there. When they all you became very, very white, he said, no, I promise you, it's a very good ashgacha, very strict ashgacha. He was the principal of the OU. He didn't know that he's eating by him. You know, they sent him to a family. Hashem punished him to show him, like Shlomo HaMelech said, don't be tzaddik arbe. Sometimes I find people that makpid in Chalav Israel. I don't want to tell you what they do at nights. <laughs> Amevin, Yavin. Who are you fooling? If you drink all your life OUD, you won't go to Gehenom, I promise you. But the things that they do every hour, every night, the Gehenom is wide open waiting for them, to swallow them alive. That they not worry about. OUD? Goy! It's a Goy! It's a Sheget! Why? He ate ice cream OUD. That's Sheget. But speaking all day Lashonara in a shtibel until 12 o'clock, beautiful. All day Lashonara murdering this family, murdering that. Nobody cares. You put milk or you did your, on your coffee? Shake it. You cannot pray here. You cannot can go out of here. Oh, he doesn't have this gartel, you know. He doesn't without gartel. Get out, don't. You know, we don't want you in our shul. Who kick him out? The one who sold non-kosher food for 10 years to all the rabbis in Monzi. He was blowing the shofar, reading in the Torah, and decide which kid will make it to yeshiva and which one would not get scholarship. No, this boy not, this, huh? <laughs> in the, anyway. Why? So, so, I always say, there's a lot of these things, it's a show-off. But Hashem, Baruch Hashem, is not blind. He sees everything. And he knows who is a show-off and who is real. You cannot fool him. Ein roa, ve'ozen shomat, ve'chol ma'asecha ba'sefer nichtavim. As I who watch over you, as he who listens to you, and everything you do is recorded in a book of God. You cannot delete this sentence from the Torah. I wish it was possible, but it's not possible. Ein <laughs> roa, there's a camera. So all your life is recorded. And everything is audio recorded also, not only video. And one day, we will analyze what did you do today, why you hung so much in traffic, why you cut people, why you cheat, why you lie, why this, why that, why you never thought about Birkat Amazon. One person asked me, uh, when I smoke my drugs, do I have to make a bracha? <laughs> so I said to him, yes. He said, really? 
עוד ברכה, עשה ברכת הדרך. Now I have an addition to that. Before you pray 18, you say, יהי רצון לפניך, שתוליכני לשלום, ותגיעני אל מחוז חפצנו לחיים שמחה ולשלום. Why? You're about to go on a journey. By the time of 18, you'll be in China, you'll be in Japan, you'll be in Israel, you'll be by your uncle, this, until you don't remember where you are, in Yerushalayim, in the... ברכת הדרך. We laugh. But we need to cry. Bezrat Hashem will see you next Sunday. Please tell all your friends. Again, thank you to the Shul Magen Avraham. Thank you to Shlomo Daniel for helping to organize. And thank you for J-Root Radio that started this lecture. Thanks to them we are here. Thank you very much. Shavua Tov.